Hi, I'm Dr. Eric Westman, and this is the Keto Made Simple podcast. Let's begin. I'm going to just get right into uh, to the slides. Um, the talk I'm going to be giving today is one I first gave at uh, the Society of Metabolic Health Practitioners and then also Keto Fest, and it's about the heart. And it's going to be a little different in that I'm going to, you know, explain what the heart does, kind of a refresher. It's really kind of a complicated organ. And uh, if um, uh, you don't know anything about the heart, that's okay. I mean, you know that it's a pump, that you need it, that sort of thing. Or you know about pacemakers. Um, uh, those are the most common things that people have to have done. Uh, or you know about the coronary artery stents and things like that. I'll get into all of that. Um, and um, then also give you the rationale for why a keto diet would be particularly good for the heart. Yeah, amazing, huh? <laughs> Total reversal of, of what uh, we were all taught, you know. Um, so again, thanks to Kyle. Uh, uh, Screen Act for uh, being the admin, letting you in, um, and um, into the the Zoom. I hope the Zoom is going well for everyone. Um, so I'm going to start to share my screen, um, and go to my slides. And can you see that thumbs up there? Great, thank you. So, keto reverses heart failure. So, if in fact, the, the cases that I talk about, it's not coronary artery disease or, or um, blockages getting better. I don't have data on that. And, and if you do, I'd like to know about it. <laughs> um, and I'll talk about tests that can be done. But I'm going to present our three cases of people whose heart failure got better, but reversed. And so it's not having to do with the coronary arteries. It has to do with the squeezing of the muscle. So um, I gave this in July, uh, one of the first times there. Let's see. There we go. So uh, the heart can be thought of as having three main uh, components. There's a fourth one, the endocrine part, that I didn't really get into because there's nothing known about a keto diet and the endocrine function of the heart that I'm aware of. But there's, number one, most of you are probably uh, in tune to the fact that the heart muscle functions as a pump. And the, the little chambers are called the atria, the, and the, the big ones are called the ventricles. For atrium, plural atria, ventricles are the big ones. And uh, then if you know or have thought about coronary artery disease or blockages or when people talk about something being good or bad for the heart, they usually, they don't talk about the heart muscle. They talk about the blood flow to the heart muscle or the coronary arteries themselves. Here, you know, a stylized drawing, you can see the uh, arteries here, these tubes, uh, look, look at the little worms on the heart. That's how the blood gets around from the, the outside uh, to the heart itself. And I'll talk about that in, in detail. But the third thing that has to do with pacemakers and, and uh, uh, palpitations, things like atrial fibrillation, it is really the, uh, the electrical system of the heart, the conduction system. You know, how, how does how does it all fit together that the, you know, the lub dub, lub dub kind of sound is actually the, the top of the heart contracting and then the bottom. So it's like a preload and then a squeeze. So a lump, 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 like that. So, and that's, it's a fascinating electrical system that I'll go into as well. Um, and, uh, so when someone says, Oh, the heart, what part of the heart, you know, it's kind of like, when someone says the cholesterol in the blood, I'm like, what part of the cholesterol? You know, are you talking about the, the good or the bad? I mean, now I know you go beyond that, I hope. But there's a large LDL and a small LDL and 
course, we focus on the HDL and triglyceride, but um, I'll get to that a little bit as we talk about the coronary arteries. Um, so this will be kind of a primer uh, uh, for basic. If you don't know anything, I'll, I'll give you this overview, and I hope to get into some detail, kind of into uh, what a medical student would need to know, actually. Uh, the heart pumps the blood through the circulatory system, of course, and this is now being taught in, in middle school in the U.S., you know, that there's a, uh, a system, a circulatory system, and um, fascinating to know the history of how this was figured out. It, for a long time, it was thought that the, the blood went away from the heart and then went back to the heart, kind of like the ocean and a tide coming in and out, and it was the uh, um, doctor who put the uh, hand or finger on the veins to show that there were valves and that it was really just going in one direction. But, you know, that was relatively recently. Uh, so here on the left side, the red is stylized, again, for being arterial uh, or oxygenated blood that's come out of the lungs, and then the oxygen is delivered to the organs, um, and then the blood doesn't turn blue, but it's stylized to be not oxygenated uh, when it comes back to the right side of the heart. And then the, then the pumping goes at the same time, left and the right side, and you get the, um, oh, sorry about that, the uh, right side of the heart pumps the blood through the lungs. So it's called the pulmonary arteries, gets oxygenated. And, uh, you know, take a deep breath, feel the oxygen hitting the, the, the blood, uh, and then the pulmonary veins, you know, yes, it's a vein, but it has oxygen in it. It's a great test question for medical students, which vein has oxygen in it, uh, but it's a vein because it's coming back to the heart. Um, and then that gets, uh, the, uh, uh, aorta is here at the beginning and then comes around the side and, and you can get scans of the aorta here. You can get the echocardiogram as a scan of the heart itself here, an ultrasound. Um, and that, that's what's called the circulation or the um, systemic circulation out here, and then the pulmonary circulation here. But it, it all it, it is um, energized by this pump that, you know, like a diesel engine, you know, it's just constant, or I don't know, but, but it's constantly going. It's, you know, it's like a, the, the pump for, uh, for a pool or something. You know, it's just, it's got to constantly go, uh, which is amazing. Um, I got into medicine, actually, because I was just curious about how things worked. You know, and and uh, I'm you know, still learning today. And so there's something you need to know about that. Um, there's a number, uh, it's a simple number to remember. Uh, about half of the blood is ejected with each pump. That's called the ejection fraction at the bottom of the screen here. The percent of blood pumped per contraction is about 50% or 55%. So normal EF is 55%. So as a shortcut, if someone's had a heart attack or they have heart failure, we doctors think about, well, okay, well, what's your EF? You know, um, and people generally know 55% being the normal. Um, so the heart doesn't totally squeeze hundred percent out, but about 50%. And that's a good, uh, uh, normal amount. If it's, you know, 30%, 20%, 15%, 15%, that's a, you know, kind of a, a really weak heart that's been damaged. Um, and, um, yeah, so I mean, you, know, you don't need to know the detail on, on this picture about the insides and but there are valves I'm not talking about. Uh, valves of the heart. I think that just kind of needlessly complicates it right now. Um, for uh, I don't know anything about the keto diet and the heart valves, uh, so I didn't really talk about that. But the valves um, of the heart make sure that the blood go in one direction, um, and that's how it can be kept going in one direction uh, without too much coming back in. So a heart attack is a sudden reduction in blood flow to this muscle. To the pump, uh, it, the uh, pathophysiology, the the damage or the the process that occurs, is totally different than it, it, than the muscle itself. It's it's in the artery going to the muscle, feeding 
the oxygen that's in the blood to the muscle. So uh, when we talk about coronary artery disease, we're talking about the plaque buildup and blood clots in the arteries that are going to the muscle. And here on the bottom right, you can see the stylized picture again of the coronary arteries. And then here, there's a blockage and a muscle that's dying here in purple. Um, and so that's what we're trying to prevent when we're trying to prevent heart attacks or prevent heart damage from coronary artery disease. The, uh, the arteries provide the blood and nutrients to the muscle itself. Um, so there are three major coronary artery disease coronary arteries that can be affected. And um, you can see here, this left main actually has two branches that come from one. And, uh, uh, and if you have a blockage here, that's colloquially called the widow maker, because if you block this, the, the blood to the, the big part of the heart that pumps out to the, the body may stop or be totally damaged. And that, that is not uh, compatible with life if your heart stops for a period of time. Um, so that's the left main artery. And then it, uh, the left anterior descending is because as you look at the heart here, it's kind of reversed. The right side of the body is on the left side of the screen. The left side of the body is on the right side of the screen. So we're looking at the heart itself. So the left anterior descending comes down the left side of the heart. And then the left circumflex goes around to the back of the heart. The right coronary goes to the back side of the heart as well. Uh, and the right uh, artery um, is actually not so important because it, it's not providing blood to the major uh, systemic muscle. Remember, you have those two muscles. Um, of course, it is important, but um, uh, the damage to the left side can do worse uh, in terms of heart failure because the pump isn't going to be working as well if you had damage to the heart. Now, you might have a spasm of these arteries that have temporary blockage and have chest pain and, and the symptoms that come from a, a heart attack, but then the spasm might relieve itself and then the pain goes away and you don't actually have damage to the heart. Or you might have a, a blockage that gets reversed by a, you go to the uh, hospital, they do a catheterization, they open it up, let the blood flow get in there before there's uh, any damage to the heart. So how long the duration of the blockages or the lack of oxygen matters, uh, and you want to get attention just as soon as you can. Now, that was all stylized stuff. This is what the doctor actually looks at. This is the x-ray view of a heart catheterization where the uh, tube is put up uh, either through the groin or through the arm into the artery itself. So it's going back to that top part of the heart and it, the uh, dye uh, or um, material is put in, the x-ray material that you can see on x-ray is put into those coronary arteries at the beginning. Um, and then you can visualize how the artery is, of course the heart's beating all the time uh, but these are the static pictures, and you can see these are nice, uh, robust arteries that fill the whole kind of like the stylized picture. Now, if there's a coronary artery blockage on the catheterization here on the left side, the right coronary artery there is 100% blocked. You can see the, um, and I just wanted to show these because it's not like these are perfect pictures. You know, there's there's some interpretation that's being done here. Now, not with that total blockage, but um, after the stent procedure in the left panel, you see the blood flow has returned. Um, but on the right side here, you can see that uh, the, the black part uh, of the picture, which is the artery itself, is kind of covered or with the, the white, and that's from the lack of dye getting to that area. So you know so I'm just trying to say that on um, these, test, you don't actually see inside the artery itself and, and get that kind of view. You're inferring a lot in terms of the, what percent is blocked and where the blockages are. Um, and um, that's why, you know, I'll hear people tell stories. One doctor said this, one doctor said that. And, and even though it's the same test, you might have different interpretations. And that's because it's not a perfect test. 
even the heart catheterization, although that's, that's the best test we have in terms of visualizing urgently where the blood flow is and where it isn't. Um, but so you might um, actually have that kind of blockage uh, here in stylized form, uh, you know, a clot or in plaque. You might get a catheter balloon put in there to to uh, relieve the, the blockage itself and open it up. Then you might have a stent, which is kind of like a Chinese finger torture thing um, here uh, put in there, um, and um, the blood flow is brought back. Um, this process and what goes on there really hasn't changed much since I was in training in the 1980s and 90s. Although the, 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 you may recall these clot-busting drugs and you still have those be put in, uh, but the stenting and all, uh, oh, here at the bottom left, you can see the catheter inserted to go up the artery and then you're actually, you know, so the blood is flowing again. This is going up against the current uh, and the catheter is placed there into the coronary arteries of the heart. Um, but uh, it's actually pretty amazing to me that the this whole procedure hasn't changed a whole lot. And there's quite a lot of controversy over whether putting a lot of stents in really is superior to just managing people medically without going in and, and putting these things in because they do block again. And I've seen people you know, at Duke is, is you know, very cardiology, uh, how should I say, friendly. Um, there a lot of stents are put in, and um, the, but some of the really critical medical cardiologists are not so convinced that they really do better than just uh, monitoring folks and treating them medically. Um, and then, of course, if you have multiple blockages where a lot of stents couldn't be used or there's a blockage in every artery, uh, then you would probably be referred to uh, heart bypass surgery where you're actually bypassing the blockages on more than one artery at a time. Um, so, so that's uh, uh, concluding the, the coronary artery disease section. Um, and I know it, this may be overkill more than you want to know, and I hope you never really have to have these kinds of things done. Um, but th this is part of my training is internal medicine. I, I um, went to Stanford undergraduate, University of Wisconsin, Madison for medical school, the University of Kentucky, Lexington for uh, internal medicine training, and then came to Duke for general medicine training, which is kind of like the teachers and the critics in the medical world are the general internists. Um, Evidence-based medicine really was started by the general internists. Um, um, and um, so that that's kind of where my, my intellectual home has been. Now, um, this pump muscle that gets the blood through the arteries, what coordinates the all of this activity is called the cardiac conduction system. It, it's really um, nervous tissue. It's not muscle uh, and uh, it's not arteries. And there's this sinoatrial node. This, this basically it's a it's a um, uh, like a metronome that fires out. Um, of course, it's under control uh, that can speed up and slow down uh, uh, by nervous system and by by hormones like uh, adrenaline. Uh, but um, this node will send out a signal to contract the atrium, uh, the atria, and then. That signal will then hit the atrioventricular node, which is a, a, again, a nervous system kind of picks up the nervous signal baton, uh, the electrical stimulation, and then sends a signal down to the heart uh, muscle, the ventricle heart muscle in a coordinated fashion that gets the muscle to contract all at once. You know, I put this in here uh, because uh, I, I just, it, it kind of irks me that doctors will just flippantly say, oh, it's good or bad for the heart. Or, you know, it's, this is more complicated than, than just saying my diet's good for the heart or bad for the heart. And I think typically they mean coronary artery disease more specifically, but um, there's just such loose language by promoters of different types of diets. Um, so, of course, the, the conduction system itself needs to be uh, supplied with 
blood and nutrients and um and the, so those our coronary arteries supply the sinoatrial node and and right uh, uh the AP, so the sa node and ab node uh, so if you have coronary artery disease with blockages in some of these arteries it might lop off one of the uh conduction systems here and you might get an arrhythmia or a a, a slowing or or yeah an uncoordinated traction as a result of it which gets into these things called bundled branch blocks and and it, you know gosh i spent years learning how to read EKGs like this one at the bottom and this is a normal EKG in it you know even if um, if you get one of these new smart watches it can take an EKG for you which is pretty amazing I, I I've done that from time to time and even um, one time I said to one of my patients can I put this watch on you so I can get a quick EKG just because I wanted to make sure that that there was an atrial beat here on um, that or atrial contraction um, so, uh, these, again, you know, I, t I spent years learning how to read these things. And, um, the wonderful thing is there are these, uh, 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 units that are available, even at airports, all that will read and, and diagnose it and, and administer, uh, treatment based on these readings. Uh, so up on the left here, the upper left, the, that small atrium, uh, or both atriums together, uh, this is the electrical signal from that conducting system. Uh, so these are electrodes that are put on the chest. If you've had an EKG done, it just measures the electrical activity. Um, and then the larger ventricles create this larger electrical impulse. And these basically represent both atria and both ventricles because they contract at the same time normally. And then the recharging of them is here in what's called a T wave. Just kind of, you know, what a wonderful system. And here, uh, now this one doesn't look so great, right? It's got a premature contraction. And this one, wow, that looks bizarre. Well, this contraction on the bottom left strip here actually started in the ventricle. So it was totally uncoordinated in terms of the ventricle and atria, and, and it didn't really have an effective blood flow going out of it. And so that's called a premature ventricular contraction of premature atrial contraction because it went normally here and the second one the bottom one is a pvc for short a pac uh and uh and these you know as we get older these occasionally happen and it's no big deal um but you might get a holter monitor which is a, a way to uh holter is the name of it where you take the monitor home with you and wear it for sometimes for weeks if it's a if it's an irregular sort of rhythm, um, here now I'm in the middle strip here. You can see these little squiggles. There's something wrong with that atrium. There's the small ventricles, the, the, or the small chambers, and the ventricle looks fine. But, you know, again, we're just looking at inferring from the electrical signal, um, and this is yeah an irregular atrial rhythm, uh, atrial flutter. Uh, here's atrial or atrial fib, perhaps. It, it, sometimes it's hard to tell. This one was called the sawtooth pattern of the atria, uh, atrial flutter. And this one in the bottom middle, that doesn't look so good, right? I mean, so the, the blood pressure is a function of how much the heart squeezes and how often it squeezes. So uh, we're getting into some bad news here. Uh, and then over the far right, the, the blood doesn't flow well when you, when you have a pulse that's this fast. In the, um, and the, you can tell the rate of how fast it's going because the speed of the paper going through is uh, tells you, uh, you know, one square is like 300 beats per minute. And so that's about 150. You're not feeling well. You're dizzy. You're, you're, this one is the ventricles going like this. You're, you're lying flat on the, the floor. That's it. Ends up being at the bottom right. That's the, you know, it's not working at all. And you're going to be, you know, uh, uh, a goner if you don't get some kind of treatment there. Um, so I think that might be all too much to know, uh, uh, but um, I think it's important to see that there are benign or, or relatively, you know, things we don't worry about in terms of arrhythmias and the things we do worry about. And so if you're having irregular heartbeats, you need to get it checked out. You just can't tell by measuring. Well, I suppose maybe if you had a typical American doctor, Western doctor, can't 
tell if it's uh, really benign or more serious. So you have to get an EKG to get it checked out. Fortunately, the, the conduction system can be replaced. These are called pacemakers. And the pacemaker could be as simple as putting one, uh, one lead here and, and it just tells the heart to beat. What you know, we have the ventricle, and and you know, it's sending an electrical signal to the muscle. The muscle responds, and and you get that. Uh, and you now the some more sophisticated ones have a a electrode lead for the atria and then the ventricle. So you get the one two one two squeeze to fill the ventricle better, and then the ventricle pushes pushes the blood out. Really pretty amazing. And then the battery is just put under the skin. Um, here and the, typically the upper chest. So this is a pacemaker, artificial pacemaker. The the SA node and AV node are the normal or um, uh, uh, anatomic pacemakers. Part of the body there, if we call pacemakers too. Um, but uh, it, so when the electrical conduction system fails, you can just replace it with this. So it, now sometimes you you may know someone who had a, a uh, sign of a very ablation procedure. Uh, sometimes there are recurrent circuits and sometimes, um, you, you go in and you can actually map out the electrical system. The, these day, these are day long procedures. Um, but you can actually go in and map out the electrical system of that individual and, and just selectively, um, intervene if there's something that is recurrent in a cervical, that sort of thing. Um, that's called electrophysiology or EP, and it's a sub, 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 sub group of cardiology because they, they're more like electricians than, than plumbers. The, the doctors who put in the catheters and look at the, the pipes or, you know, the, the arteries themselves are looking at a totally different thing. This is a, a specialty within cardiology. So when, when the pump fails, you can actually put in an artificial heart. Uh, this, uh, and of course, a heart transplant, but um, it's pretty heroic. And I, little did I know that Duke has one of the largest programs of this LVAD or ventricular assist device in the world. And so I started getting these referrals from people who, who had no pulse. And, and so that this is a, basically a, a pump here uh, you can see in the middle of the chest it's implanted and it has a continuous flow so this person has no pulse the, the muscle itself is so weak it's not contracting and yet the pump uh, takes blood from the ventricle here and squirts it into the aorta really pretty amazing uh, and then the, the battery pack is on the outside and is connected through this uh, um, wire internally um, so I started helping these folks lose weight in order to get transplants. So I am seeing people who are too heavy to get a transplant. The obesity is so uh, prevalent and in, in, in a, a culprit into heart failure as well that a lot of these people um, need a heart transplant, but they're too big, too risky to have it done. Uh, so there's a transplant list. In order to get out of the list, you need to lose weight. Many of these people need to lose weight. Um, now it's uh, complicated to take care of these patients, but with my internal medicine training, I, I'm comfortable taking care of people with heart failure. That's bread and butter to me in training. And and um, you also have to watch the anticoagulation because, as you um, might, uh, uh, sorry, uh, as you might surmise, this plastic tube here. Uh, it will clot up if the heart, uh, if the muscle, if the blood is not anticoagulated. Um, and then you have to watch the salt for the, you know, uh, as you know, for heart failure or for high blood pressure, you want to monitor the salt. So, it, so I have a modified version of the diet that I have taught you to apply to people like this. Um, pretty amazing now. So what about the keto diet? It's, that was all kind of back, background, right? So you, you have the muscle itself, the arteries, line of the muscle, and then the electrical system to make it all coordinated. 
Well, um, this first case is a 43-year-old female, excuse me, <clears throat> who works at the Duke ICU, pediatric ICU. Um, and she had acute systolic heart failure. So now you can get into which type of heart failure it is. Um, <clears throat> if that pump isn't squeezing well, then um, you can actually have the uh, fluid build up in the lung, so that's called pulmonary edema. That can be life threatening. So she had a defibrillator place, which is common. That's a that's actually a device that will shock the person uh, if the heart has one of those terrible uh, arrhythmias. Uh, if it'll do it when they're at home, um, it, again, it just kind of uh, senses it and gives the treatment. Um, so after she was hospitalized, she lost weight watching the calories, but hit a plateau. Um, she learned from her father about the keto diet and then lost 15 week, fifteen pounds over 12 weeks. It was kind of slow, but she found me at Duke. Um, and this is her weight curve uh, preceding the heart failure episode. And uh, just have to say the scale is not proportional. It's a This is a problem of the computer system we use. Uh, so five years is represented in this middle of the chart, and then only one year is represented on the far half, right half of the screen. But you can see she had uh, weighed about 300 pounds in her five foot two height, her frame, for about five years. And nobody could figure out her coronary arteries were clean, meaning there was no blockage, and no one could figure out what caused the heart failure except the obesity. Uh, you know, and you're pumping against the uh, all this extra tissue. Um, so you can see on the far right, her curve going down, she lost weight. And under our, uh, this is the same same individual just showing the weight loss curve. You now adding in now at the bottom, the heart failure um, uh, calculations. So that EF means ejection fraction. And she was when she was diagnosed, she had an ejection fraction of 20% which puts her in a severe heart failure category. And that improved over time, such that, uh, now, you know, it took took two years, uh, but uh, that's okay. <laughs> um, she's eating great food, as you know, and happy as a clam. Her ejection fraction is now 50%, and her she's, uh, she's in a mild heart failure category, 65% being normal. And she has just uh, regained her life, basically um, set up an Instagram uh, to tell the world about this. If you know about Star Trek and the Borg is this alien species that basically takes over the universe. Uh, her her uh, Instagram is Locuta of Borg. Um, and um, she, uh, uh, Jennifer, just uh, loves to talk about this. She came and spoke at one of our ADAPT events in Raleigh. Uh, earlier this year. Um, so that's case number one. Now, case number two, similarly, a gentleman who um, was affected by heart failure with an ejection fraction of 25% at the bottom left. In fact, his uh, um, story also included a weight loss surgery uh, uh, sleeve gastrectomy in 2013. And, you know, like most people who, who don't learn how to eat, after a weight loss surgery, they regain weight um, if no one ever tells them how to eat again. Um, and then uh, he basically found me in a keto diet toward the right side in this uh, roller coaster curve and well, lost from 340 pounds you know, down to 250 pounds. And his ejection fraction now is up to 42%, which is still mild heart failure. But he's regained his life. He's consulting and back at work, and I, you know, it, it's just so transformative, as, as you know I, how it can be. But this is uh, th these th this heart failure is not typically reversed, and it, it, again, it's one of those chronic things that you, you, you know doctors just don't see it getting better. Kind of like you might go to the doctor and they say, "Well, diabetes, you're going to have it forever." Not nah, not so true. You can reverse diabetes and obesity, of course. Now, uh, you might say that that was really the the weight loss that helped these two individuals. But as I was thinking about it, this is a patient of mine 
who is in her mid seventies and her heart failure has gotten to be normal. Her ejection fraction on the way bottom of the screen, you can see is a shorthand, went from 35% to 55%. And she really hasn't lost much weight. But she had an alpha lab, her diagnoses were non-ischemic cardiomyopathy, meaning the coronary disease wasn't there. The ischemic means there was coronary blockage. And, and, but she had complete heart block, meaning the, the conduction system was shot. So she had a pacemaker put in. And, uh, and over the years that I've known her, she basically has had normal heart function now. Uh, she's kind of stuck at 190, but she's got a trouble with still eating carbs. She's a carb addict, but has limited the carbs uh, uh, a lot. Uh, and I don't know that she's in ketosis all the time, but this makes me think that it's not just the weight loss that's helping the heart here. And maybe it is the ketones, huh? maybe. So what's the rationale and, and uh, how do we backfill and explain these pretty amazing cases, which um, we now have actually um, encouraged, well, no, but intrigued a heart failure fellow, a Duke cardiology fellow who's going to be going into the charts and, and looking in more detail at more people that have come through our clinic with heart problems. So I hope six months, a year from now, that we'll have a, a summary of many more people who've been on a diet like this uh, with heart problems. Um, well, it turns out that heart muscle is fueled by fat and ketones. <laughs> so I knew this because, gosh, for 20 years now, every time like a broken record, I would meet somebody uh, like um, a visiting professor or I was interviewing for a job and I I heard that the the department chair was a cardiologist, and I, as I was talking to him, I said, you know, things like, if you put fatty acids, ketones, and and glucose in a petri dish with heart muscle, what would it, you know, absorb first? And they all knew fatty acids, so and ketones. So if you have a pump and it's going all the time, you want the best form of energy delivered there, the highest concentration of energy per gram and that's fat so the hard muscle runs on fat and and shown here in, oh, in the gray and the yellow ffa means free fatty acids you add that all up uh and uh so the it's just blowing that up a bit the pie chart the on the left hand side a normal heart is about 85 percent uh 86 percent fat free fatty acids and then 6.4% ketones. And if you look, where's the sugar? Where's the glue? This is the heart muscle itself. Sugar is not there. It's not a major, it's not, it's not a contributor to the heart muscle. In fact, it'll take lactate. It, uh, um, the skeletal muscle creates lactate and the heart can use it. It's ama an amazing synergy there. So when someone has heart failure on the right, the ketone use goes up a little bit from 6 to 16 but it's still, you know, 70% fat that is fueling the heart. And ketone, or the ketones could come in there, but then glucose is really nowhere to be solved. Um, show you how shocking this is to the cardiologists today and doctors in general and the general public. This is the abstract from that paper. And it was published in 2020, which is, you know, relatively recently. And I, I remember, I, I asked, the heart uh, cardiologist back in you know, the year 2000 when I was trying to figure out, is this going to be safe? I mean, I'm not going to have people eating carbohydrates. So I don't want to kill them. And they say, ah, don't worry about the heart. It runs on fat. Okay, well, well um, here in this abstract in the middle, it says the heart primarily consumed fatty acids and comma, unexpectedly comma, little glucose. Well, think about that. It wasn't that expected to the heart. <laughs> the heart always eats. It ran on fuel by fat. It was the authors and the cardiologists that were, were surprised, not the heart. So th this is using you know modern methods, uh, state-of-the-art equipment, uh, and um, uh, the heart runs on fat. Now, you have to realize we're talking about the heart muscle itself, not the coronary arteries, not the conduction system, but um, this gave me great uh, uh, 
well, kind of glee, if you will, to be able to, you know, present to doctors that actually this is fine to use a keto diet for heart failure. Now, I'm not talking about the coronary arteries. I'm not talking about the conduction system. I'm talking about the muscle itself. But you know, what we came through was a paradigm of glucose fixes everything, right? Uh, just smush more glucose in the cell. And, and you know, the low-fat diet for heart disease era it got so distorted that this glucocentric view that glucose is great for everything. It was thought that the heart needed more glucose, even though it ran on fat. Studies were conducted to infuse glucose and insulin during heart attacks. And the studies were negative, meaning it didn't work. The infusion of glucose and insulin during heart failure or heart attack itself, meaning that heart muscle failing, did not lead to improved outcomes. And when, when the vouchers in that uh, studies now showing more ketones are being used, the way it's written is not saying ketones are good, right? It says whether this change is adaptive or maladaptive is not known. Because how, how could possibly anything other than glucose, be, and, and you can't tell people to eat fat, but the heart runs on fat. So this is a big disconnect. It's called cognitive dissonance that the reality is you want the heart to have fat. You're telling people not to eat fat. Oh, my goodness. Or, or, or maybe it's because the, the fat itself would go out of the arteries of the heart, right? That's kind of the main worry, the fat on the artery, fat of the food, duh, right? Of course, that's not what happens, but it's so logical. And, um, uh, and I... I I, I was in that world for a long time, just blindly looking at this. But um, uh, I'm thinking that that increase in ketones is a good thing when the heart is, is actually asking for more ketones and fat. Um, and that bottom uh, bullet, is, is there, there's a new drug that actually has been studied pretty well that makes the urine leak sugar called SGLT2 inhibitors, and it reduces heart failure readmission rates. But it has a consequence called normal glycemic ketoacidosis. So the only time I've seen ketoacidosis in my patients on a keto diet is when they're on this drug. I'm not, I never saw ketoacidosis until this drug came about. And it can actually cause ketoacidosis whether you're on a keto diet or not. So I, I don't want you to be taking this SGLT2 inhibitor. It's called Jardians and other Invokana, things like that. Um, if you, uh, most cardiologists are handing it out now to people with heart failure. Um, and it has been studied, but it has this negative consequence of being um, uh, infections in the urine and, and, and ketoacidosis. But there is a paper that suggests maybe the mechanism that these drugs help with heart failure is ketosis. That keto, ketosis, because the heart needs ketones. And then I'm thinking, well, why not just do a keto diet without the drug and, you know, you get the ketones from your own body fat, right? Um, so the keto diet provides fatty acids and ketones from your own body. Or if you're at your lean weight, then you're just consuming protein and fat and you're going to be burning the fat, providing ketones from your, the fat that you're eating. Um, and um, this should be pretty reassuring. Remember, FFA means free fatty acids, means fat. You add both the gray and the yellow together to get the total fat um, consumption by the heart muscle. Now, but okay, heart muscle is fine. What about those coronary arteries, right? So the keto diet of coronary blood flow, I'm sure you've heard this so many times. Well, maybe if you're new to the membership, the cardiac muscle may be fueled by fatty acids and ketones, but what about atherosclerosis, right? that causes the coronary artery disease, the narrowing and the blockage. Um, well, metabolic syndrome, also known as insulin resistance, is now implicated as the major risk factor for atherosclerosis, and which leads to that coronary artery disease and blockage. Metabolic syndrome is uh, also a major risk factor for heart failure, which is that the muscle itself failing, whether or not you have the blockage or not. 
And the keto diet reduces the cardiometabolic risk by reducing the metabolic syndrome. So there's a good rationale for why a keto diet would reverse heart failure because of the insulin resistance being the cause of heart failure. And then because of the metabolic syndrome being reversed, we may actually be able to stop or, um, or prevent progression of coronary artery disease with a keto diet. It just works by a different mechanism. What about the conduction system in the keto diet? So remember, arrhythmias can be benign, meaning harmless or serious uh, palpitations. Uh, some people have them early on during the, the kind of keto adaptation phase uh, because it's fluid shifts. I don't worry about those if they go away. Uh, but uh, there was a study that showed atrial fibrillation was associated with lower carbohydrate intake, and it got big news. But the lowest quartile, the, the lowest fourth of the people in this study were, were eating 37% carbohydrate. So it really wasn't addressing a diet like a keto diet that only has 5 to 10% carbohydrate. So it was really apples and oranges. The study didn't say that, didn't apply to a carb intake that is as low as you have on a keto diet. If there's a problem, it's an infrequent one and and you know uh, like like um, gout and uh, kidney stone or atrial fibrillation these things I see them occasionally on people losing weight on a keto diet I see them on people not eating a keto diet so the relative frequency of these things um, I don't know if it's any difference than any other way of eating so it actually may not be related to the diet at all. Um, and remember, um, if you get in a car accident on a keto diet, it probably wasn't the diet that caused it, right? People get in car accidents, but but if you're going to be you know quick to say, aha, see, that diet's bad for you, uh, I don't fall victim to that anymore. I want a, a, you know, a comparative kind of study to know the relative uh, frequency of these things. So to sum up, sum up uh, cardiac muscle is fueled by fatty acids and ketones during normal conditions and heart failure. Coronary artery disease is caused by metabolic syndrome, and a keto diet reverses that. So based on this physiology, there should be no concern about using nutritional ketosis to treat heart failure or even just a low-carb diet. A well-formulated keto diet, which is a distinction from the internet keto diet, uh, it will also lead to weight loss, which may improve heart failure independently in nutritional ketosis. So in two of the cases I presented, they lost weight as well. I can't say that it was the diet itself, uh, but keep in mind the keto diet reduces cardiometabolic risk by addressing the metabolic syndrome, the triglyceride and HDL in the blood, the waist circumference, glucose level and blood pressure elevation that may not be to the level of actually hypertension or diabetes. Um, so I presented three cases of improvement of heart failure while following a well-formulated keto diet. Of course, clinical monitoring is is, is essential during such a program with someone who understands how to, to manage heart failure and de-prescribe medicines. Um, of course, we can't say that it's the keto diet itself. Other other types of diets or, or uh, surgery or medications that lead to weight loss may do it as well. But, you know, I really haven't seen anyone else coming, anteing up the cases like this of their programs doing this sort of thing. Um, and these are not commonly presented in our obesity medicine conferences. Um, it, and a review of the fuel use of the heart, the underlying causes of coronary artery disease, is reassuring that this approach may be, this, this is my hedging, right? My if someone else steals the slide, then you know I have to have that in there. And we strongly urge cardiologists to consider the keto diet and their clinical and research efforts for heart failure. Um, little did I know when I presented this information at Low Carb USA in San Diego uh, this summer, Steve Finney, one of my teachers and and one of the principals behind the Verda Health program out of Sil Silicon Valley. At he said that he and Jeff Wolowick are now funded to study heart failure and uh, on a 
by the Department of Defense in the U.S. And so it's fantastic. I think it's going to be actually looking at drinking ketones versus the keto diet on its own, uh, getting ketones from the diet change. Um, and remember, I'm still kind of waiting for studies on drinking ketones before we see those. Don't 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 do it. Don't spend money on that. Uh, uh, we don't know really know about the safety of that. Um, even though it might suppress hunger, uh, you know, no question it might do that. But um, so the study is actually funded, which a study that's funded doesn't mean it works. <laughs> so careful. Um, there's a sort of, well, there's a study going on. We, oh, well, it must be good. No, if a study's going on, it doesn't mean that it's over saying that it, it was a good thing. It might turn out not to work. So, uh, but it, you have to, if you never study it, you'll never know in that, uh, kind of uh, scale with a lot of people. Um, so the heart has at least three different factors to consider. If you say something's good or bad for the heart, there's the muscle itself, there's the blood flow, the coronary arteries, there's the conduction system itself. Um, and I hope that was helpful. If you hadn't heard anything about the heart before and or if you even needed a ref refresher, um, that's how an internal medicine doctor would summarize and, and, and teach. Um, and, uh, yeah, well, I, I hope that, and that was just a reminder that this has been presented it's out there in, um, uh, uh, video form, uh, while we will record this and send it to the membership. Uh, if you want someone else to watch this, you can track down the, um, meetings that I presented this at uh, Keto Fest, I think uh, part of it was um, uh, also at the San Diego Low Carb USA. Okay, was that too much? Yeah, uh, uh, um, let's see, let me, let me see a few questions here. Great. Uh, no sound at all. Um, best fuel for the heart is fat and ketones. Do you happen to know what the best fuel for the GI system is? Well, fat and ketones, obviously. <laughs> yeah. um, but I don't know. So maybe I should do a, a talk on the GI system. Um, uh, and they, are any aortic aneurysms hereditary? Yes, I think so. I think, um, and of course, they might just be degenerative, meaning you've lived an American lifestyle. So um, the good thing about these arteries is that you can measure them with ultrasound, which is a non-invasive sort of technique, meaning there's no, uh, you don't have to have a, a, a catheter put in the artery. You don't have to have x-rays. And there's a, a company in the U.S. that goes around, sets up shop to do ultrasounds uh, outside the medical system that's called lifeline screening and I highly recommend that you get that done. Um, in fact, Dr. Tro Collegian, who has the podcast Low Carb MD, brought his uh, his um, ultrasound to Keto Fest and I, I asked them to bring it. I, he hooked it up to his phone and, and sure enough, he, he was um, he were, he were able to see the artery narrowing or, or no narrowing, but he didn't have narrowing. But you could actually just see on the phone. You know, when I was in training in the, the 80s, I thought certainly any day now, all doctors will have an ultrasound in their office. And, you know, instead of the stethoscope, which, I mean, gives you some information, if you had an ultrasound, you could be doing the, the thyroid, the arteries, the heart, the looking for the aorta. Uh, and, but because of, you know, money likes to go and the way money flows, there are monopolies on all these things, but um, I would um, uh, recommend that you get ultrasounds, uh, and then you might even get the uh, coronary artery calcium score, uh, but um, you have to be careful at interpreting these things and always have someone who's experienced in looking at them help you interpret it. Um, uh, let's see. Okay, gee, I said, well, yeah, maybe I, I maybe we should just go through an internist view of, of the body, um, and maybe we get a psychiatrist to do the brain for us. Um, um, 
of course, I, I was with a, a visiting group, a doctor, uh, an internist, and his, a, a fresh out of diet, a dietitian school, an RD. They live outside of Dallas. Uh, if any of you need a keto-friendly doctor, um, they uh, visited my office last week. I am so impressed with, you know, getting. So this internist was applied and would basically what I had to do 20 years ago uh, to kind of figure it all out myself. He, he did it four years ago in his own way. And, and um, you know, uh, it was really interesting to see how they teach it, how they, they implement it. Uh, and the nutrition, an RD, meaning traditionally trained registered dietitian, he was so concerned that when he got out of school that he'd have to get a job where he was telling people to eat carbs because he knew about low carb diet, that he found uh, Dr. Sean, Dr. Sean Murphy, and they're they're just like on fire with this. And um, it was actually a mutual teaching for it. They spent two days in my office, and um, uh, I'm, it encourages me, you know, keeps me going to see that other doctors are are finding this and using their own um, method of learning and and doing and. Um, of course, Sean, Dr. Murphy said, you know, how do I learn about this? And, and I'm hopeful that we or the Society of Metabolic Health Practitioners will one day have a course where a doctor can just, you know, learn all they need to know. Uh, but as you see, even one organ is complicated. So, uh, but if you had that initial training, uh, it's not as complicated as it might seem to you. Um, uh, let's see. Um, Oh yeah, you saw this at Keto Fest. Uh, thank you for not my we just see it again. Uh, they used to say in medical school you have to see things seven times before you'll remember it. So I think his doctors are a little slow. Um, John uh, said we know glucose is used by muscles, brain, and liver. Glucose, well, yeah, but it's not obligate. So um, muscle doesn't have to use glucose, uh, although. It's still thought that skeletal muscle. So, so the muscle, heart muscle, is special. It's called cardiac muscle. Then there's skeletal muscle, which is the the um, you know like your thigh or, or legs and arms. Um, skeletal muscle really, uh, it's only thought to need glucose when you're sprinting or under anaerobic, meaning no oxygen conditions. They use this fat just fine. In fact, we prefer fat. Uh, some parts of the brain, sure. And then the liver actually, I don't think it uses glucose at all. Um, so the, uh, yeah, I, I, John, the the obligate cells that meaning they obligate glucose meaning they need glucose are cells that don't have mitochondria or nuclei. So the red blood cells in the blood need to use glucose, and the white blood cells in order to have a respiratory burst uh, uh, to fight infection need glucose. This is why I think your blood glucose goes up when you're when you have an infection. It's to help the cells get enough glucose to fight the infection. Um, and then the cells of the kidney, where there's very little oxygen, called the kit, renal papilla, need glucose because there's no oxygen. So if there's no mitochondria, there's no uh, TCA cycle enzyme to to burn the fatty acid and ketone. And uh, if there's no oxygen then you have to use glycolysis or the, the glucose burning part of the cell. Um, but uh, And then the glia part of the brain is thought to need glucose. But when you summarize all of this up, it's not much. Not much in terms of grams of glucose. And you can create all of that by the process called gluconeogenesis, creating glucose from the amino acids and the glycerol from fat. Um, uh, let's see, does a heart murmur, so, you know, the heart murmur, again, listening to sound, not the electrical activity, like the EKG, um, some are benign, some are serious, and the only way to know is to get some sort of echocardiogram or scan these days. I, I, these days, I wouldn't rely just on listening with a stethoscope. Uh, uh, doctors these days is, uh, I don't think are trained as well as the doctors were who didn't have echocardiograms. Now, 
cardiologists just go for the, the ultrasound, the echo, it's the same kind of thing. Uh, so no, if you have a murmur, you want to check out, um, um, with more, um, testing, um, We'd like to hear a presentation on the brain, okay? And um, I might ask a, uh, uh, a psychiatrist or neurologist. You know, so internal medicine, basically, we carved out this part of the body, right? Psychiatrists and neurologists have this part of the body, although even then, those two specialties are, are kind of distinct from each other. There's, it's the same organ. Um when Dr. Murphy came with his dietitian, what I wanted to say is I, I told him that I should be a GI specialist because pretty much every chronic gastroenterologist, every GI condition gets better. I, I mean, it's phenomenal how not eating carbohydrate can improve the GI tract function. Um, uh, yeah, well, so th well, that that's an hour. Oh, boy. Uh, well, I got to some questions, um, uh, but uh, maybe if there's some pressing, raise your hand and come on up on the Zoom screen. That's why we have it. <laughs> uh, and you're very welcome. Um, uh, yeah, so the human conditions like ulcers of colitis or Crohn's can improve. Um, there was a Dr. Wolfgang Lutz who wrote a book, a German doctor on uh, life without bread. Uh, and in there, he had a, the largest case series that I know of. Of course, it's a book. It wasn't a paper, uh, but I don't know why he would, would, lie, would lie about it. But, um, uh, you know, I, I have some folks with UC, ulcerative colitis, and Crohn's. But I tell you, uh, they don't stick with me. You know, I'm a... I'm a Consultant, I'm. I they don't have. I'm not their GI doctor. Uh, I would love to consult or collaborate with the GI doctor who they're going to to help them modify the diet. Um, it, it, you know, it, it, carb addiction affects everyone in certain to a certain degree, and um, I wonder if there's this. Um, well, there might be tough or or conflicting advice from the GI doctors to get people off it. But um, I haven't seen the study yet on Crohn's or ulcerative colitis, but there's a clinical signal that fit can improve, definitely. Um, and uh, yeah, Amy Berger's book, The Alzheimer's Antidote, has a lot of information about brain function and nutrition. Um, Keto-friendly cardiologist, yeah. Well, um, it's not an oxymoron, uh, but it, it is uh, they're hard to find. Of course, uh, Brett Scher, who works with Diet Doctor, uh, lives in, um, uh, at least he used to live in San Diego. I'm not sure where he lives anymore. Uh, Dr. Nadir Ali in Houston. They both have videos on uh, LDL and all, how to interpret things. I know you can at least talk to Dr. Ali as a consultant. Um, you know, I, I have two local doctors at Duke who are preventive cardiology doctors. So you might search out not the cardiologists that do catheterizations or, or electrophysiology, seek out the ones who call themselves preventive cardiologists, and they may be more um, keto, keto friendly. Um, and yeah, the, the blanket kind of blind, do a, a low fat diet. Uh, it, it, we've gone way beyond that. I, I'm working on the metaphor of uh, cell phones and flip phones or phones with cords. And, you know, the low fat diet came out when we were all using phones with cords. You know, it's not that they don't work. I mean, you, you, you might still have one. It's just that I have a smartphone and, and I can do many more things with it. I take pictures and and apps and all that so it's just it's a new technology uh, and you know it's just amazing how the medical world doesn't adopt new nutrition technology like keto and then the, of course the ultimate irony is we're just going back to what was known 100 years ago and used so it's nothing new but don't tell people that um it's uh it's like uh 
it's like a smartphone. I, I don't really know how the smartphone works. I mean, I, I suppose I could read about it and all that. Uh, and, uh, you know, once computer chips got into this new era, I, I lost track of how they work, but that doesn't bother me. I still use it. Right. So you don't have to know how a keto diet works. Bye for now.